Okay, welcome. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the president of the International Social Capital Association. Uh, in this session, I'm going to be giving a, a brief introduction to social capital for researchers, really looking at uh, you know, what social capital is, um, gaining an understanding of the concept of social capital, also talking about the value of the concept, you know, why we might want to use a concept such as social capital and what we can get out of it, as well as talking about the outcomes, because I think talking about the outcomes to help us to understand what social capital is, and we, outcomes are different for different research projects. And so thinking about what the outcomes are for your project can be really quite useful. I'll also talk about what complicates social capital theory, because there's a, a lot of different things that can create complexity in there as well. And also the an introduction to different conceptual approaches. Um, also then talking about the challenges of, of reading literature and the challenges of, of conducting research, as well as details um, of where you can get some further support as well if you're interested in it. So if we start talking about social capital, getting started with social capital, it's, it's quite um, puzzling, cumbersome, um, intriguing. You know, it implies that social relationships are valuable and important. And of course, this isn't a new or a novel idea. We've known for hundreds, thousands of years, like throughout human evolution, we've known that social relationships are very, very important. But in modern times, they tend to be overlooked and undervalued. So it's, it's intriguing. A lot of people are really interested in it. But the idea of this, these social relationships being valuable and calling them capital can be a bit puzzling, a bit cumbersome, and even a bit difficult to, to understand. I think it highlights the, the social and cultural processes. So it can be corrective to asocial thinking that has permeated a lot of our organizations and politics and media and other areas of modern life. And it certainly has sparked widespread interest. You know, in the last 30 years, social capital as a concept in research and practice has spread across all of the social sciences and even into some of the physical sciences. And it's a, a great interest in politics and international development and a range of other practical areas as well. But all of this interest across so many different disciplines and, and levels and, and contexts means has created different meanings and different approaches. And this can be really quite confusing. And reading the literature requires an understanding of these different conceptual approaches. Otherwise, we can, we can get mismatches. And unfortunately, in the literature, we see quite a lot of mismatches that, that can really create even more confusion when you're first reading the literature for the first time. And social capital is quite difficult to measure. I think a lot of people have measured it for sure, but it's an ongoing challenge. There are, are many different approaches out there that you'll find in the literature. And unfortunately, there's often some poor scholarship associated with the way in which social capital is measured. Um, you know, inappropriate assumptions being made or tautologies or, you know, these kinds of things that can really bring into question the, the results of some of the research that's been done. So that's my very brief getting started with social capital, perhaps some of the things that we need to look out for when we're conducting research in this area. But I wanted to get on to talking about what social capital is. Now, there's hundreds of different definitions out there. And when you're reading them, quite often, it can be a bit confusing. Some of these um, definitions may leave you feeling a bit um, confused still, like there's still outstanding questions. Well, what does it really mean and, and how do I actually use it? And so I think it's useful to get back to this kind of break the two words apart and look at what each word means in, in separation to get an idea about what we generally mean by social capital as a term together. So social can mean a variety of different things. You know, we could be talking about social relationships like networks, but we could be talking about society, you know, social structure and organization as well. So there's a variety of different ways we might interpret the word social. And on the capital side, you know, we're talking about being productive, beneficial or valuable in some way. You know, the, the, the nature of capital having a, a potential or ability or a capacity. And one of the other uh, important uh, requirements for it to be capital is that we can invest in it with some sort of reasonable expectation of return. 
So if we put these words together, and this is by no means a definition, but I think this is intuitively what we mean by social capital, is that it involves a, a potential or an ability or a capacity to be social in ways that are productive or beneficial or valuable. And I think that's kind of a, a good way of understanding what we're talking about. And I think it, it cuts across a lot of the different definitions. We're talking about something social that has this sort of potential or ability to, or, and capacity. Um, to be valuable, basically. So you've probably heard about a range of different forms of capital and, and the relationship between these forms of capital, you know, that there are a lot of relationships. And so going all the way back to one of James Coleman's first uh, publications on social capital was social capital in the creation of human capital. And so clearly social capital is related to human capital, perhaps social capital creating human capital, but human capital also perhaps creates social capital because social skills, for example, are an individual competency. We could talk about them being human capital that an individual can possess, but social skills are so important in being able to develop social relationships and not only develop social relationships, but actually to realize the outcomes of social relationships as well. And so clearly there's a very close relationship here between human capital and social capital. And also cultural capital perhaps overlaps with social capital, depending on the way, of course, in which you define each of the concepts. But I think we can also say perhaps that human capital also overlaps with social capital in some key ways. Um, but this is the, the complexity of these different forms of capital, and I think it's important to identify the interrelationships between them. So what is the value of the concept? Why should we care about social capital? Why should we use it in our research? And I think the, the key thing here is that social capital communicates something that we couldn't communicate before, before we had the term social capital. So it's something that I think is often overlooked and undervalued from conventional analysis and reporting. And I think it's also part of a trend in to, to communicate these forms of non-economic value as capital. So things like natural capital and human capital that have been uh, researched since probably the 1970s or 1980s, as well as intellectual capital and a variety of other forms of sort of non-traditional or non-economic forms of capital. And I think there's also some other attempts that are closely related to this, this desire to incorporate the, the importance of social, uh, things like social impact or social value or social investment, I think are other attempts um, to include these really important aspects in, in analysis. And it also provides a, a way to understand and improve practice as well. So a lot of the social capital research is, is interested in how can we improve a particular situation? You know, how can we improve the function of an organization or society or our economy or any other particular area of interest as well? So social capital provides us with that way because it's, social capital is those things that are productive, that have that potential. And so if we can improve it, and we can understand how to improve it, um, then we can, there can be great benefits reached from it. So what I'd like you to do is think about for your own research, you know, what, why is social capital important to you? Why do you want to use this concept of social capital? What does it help you to explain or to communicate? Um, and I'd like you to post that in the, in the chat in Zoom so that we can get a few different perspectives and, and different ideas. So one example that you might, for me, for example, you might say that social capital provides a way to understand and improve the productivity of teams. Um, so that's just one example. So I'd be very interested to hear what you think, uh, why, why you think social capital is important for your research context. So I'll just give you a moment to, to post something in the chat, see if you can um, come up with an idea. Looks like you're still thinking or typing. I, I can share with you when I first approached social capital about more than 20 years ago, I was interested in, in how 
um, groups could receive funding and they could be set up and they could have um, really great structures, but some groups were more effective than others. And I thought it was the, the social aspect, particularly the social relationships that people had, I felt was really important. And I, I think I felt like they were being overlooked. So I embraced social capital as a way to understand the benefits of those social relationships that people brought together in groups to collectively achieve things. Yep. So one of you has said to get the right talent. Yep. So that certainly could be uh, an area. So we'll move on. There's a couple more questions and opportunities for you to put forward some ideas in the chat as well as we go through. So if we think about the outcomes of social capital, I think a lot of them are social action. So things like cooperation or collective action, uh, pro-social actions such as giving, sharing, helping, caring, supporting, these kinds of things, as well as social introductions and reduced transaction costs and, and the nature and frequency of various actions with various consequences that we might not necessarily think of as being social actions. So there's a bit of overlap here between some of these different items I've put in the list because cooperation, we might say, is very similar to, to giving and sharing and helping. It kind of they're, they're, they're similar. Um, perhaps social introduction. So when you introduce somebody else so that perhaps they could get a job or you recommend somebody to, to, to get a, a reliable mechanic um, to fix their car or make those sort of social introductions, it's a bit like helping or, or caring or cooperation, but I've, I've separated these out. They're similar, but I, but I think there's some overlap between them as well. And this final point here about various actions, because something like littering, you know, throwing rubbish out the window of your car, uh, social capital may help to reduce the incidence of littering in a particular uh, group or society. But it's not necessarily, littering isn't necessarily a social action. We might th not think of it as a social action. And there's other things too, like you might think of, um, you know, your own health behavior as not being really a social action. It's just how you look after your own health, maybe the exercise that you do or the food that you eat. And so social capital can have an important influence on that as well. So clearly there's a range of different social actions. Uh, that might come about, but there's also intrinsic values that come about. We don't necessarily need actions in order to realise some of the benefits of social capital. So having a sense of belonging or social identity, these can be values that we can realise without any need to actually engage in actions. And this is really important in fields of study like mental health and social capital, um, because people don't necessarily need to do anything in order to get the benefits of, of social capital. So then we could say from all of those actions, there's all of these sort of second order or flow on outcomes or benefits that might arise as a result of them. So you might read in the literature quite often about information flows, for example, or innovation and creativity. And the reason why I've put them over here on this right hand side is because things like giving and sharing and helping they can lead to uh, innovation, for example, but often you'll need multiple of these things. You might need some giving and some sharing and some social introductions and some cooperation and all of those things may lead to, to innovation occurring or resilience or economic development and so forth. So I tend to think of these as first order on the left, outcomes and then second order outcomes on the right. And this isn't an exhaustive list. There's, there's bound to be a range of more uh, other outcomes that are likely to occur. And the other thing about this list is they're all positive. And as we know, not every outcome of social capital is positive. And so we need to keep that in mind. So what I'd like to ask you then is what outcomes are relevant for your research? So I'll just take it back one step so you can see the outcomes at the same time. So perhaps post in the chat what you think are the most important outcomes for your particular research context. And what we tend to find is, depending on what you're interested in, the outcomes are likely to be different because it's not always the same. For example, if we're working in a, in a technology sector and we're really interested in innovation, then we'd be far more interested in innovation than we may be in, in resilience perhaps, or perhaps even in, in psychological well-being and happiness um, as the outcomes of social capital. So any ideas, 
what sort of what sort of outcomes are, are relevant for your particular research? Yep. So we've got uh, economic development opportunities and innovation and creativity. Anybody else identified what sort of outcomes are most relevant for your research? It's useful to think this through. Uh, so another one is psychological and physical wellness and happiness, yeah. So it's useful to think these things through because when you start narrowing in on what outcomes are most relevant for your research, you can start to think about what aspects of social capital perhaps are also most relevant for your, for your research. Because social capital is a bit of an umbrella term that includes a range of different process, social processes and factors. And so you don't necessarily want to look at absolutely everything. You may be able to narrow in and target those things that are most relevant for your particular research. So we'll, we'll move on. So the social capital, as I mentioned, is, is very, very complicated. And what I've done here is I've identified some of the things that create that complexity. So on the left, we have the level of interest. So some research projects are very interested in social capital for an individual or and how individuals can utilize and benefit from social capital. Whereas others may be interested in the group internally within the group, or perhaps how a group externally to the group can engage people and develop social capital. Or in fact, we may be interested at the, the community or society level, at that really big macro level. And so there's clearly some very significant differences depending on our level of interest. And if we move over to perspective of benefit, we can also see some differences here that for our research, we may be interested in how social capital can benefit an individual, or we may be interested in how social capital can benefit the collective overall, or perhaps even both. And then from different researchers' perspectives, there's different methodological requirements as well. So sometimes it needs to be quantifiable, or perhaps it could be qualifiable, or it may need to be observable or modelable. And these different methodological requirements can therefore shape our understanding of what social capital actually is. Uh, typically, if we're focusing on it being quantifiable, then we need it to be tangible. You know, we need it to be observable so that we can actually um, measure it in, in some sort of way. And therefore, we often, that might shape the way in which we think about social capital. And there's also very different theories of human experience that can be found across all of the different disciplines and subject areas that study social capital. So perhaps um, we may be looking at self-interest, how, say, economics, how uh, individual actors pursue self-interest, or perhaps, say, within sociology, we see that the socially situated um, concept or theory of human experience. Perhaps within anthropology or um, biology, we might look at instinctive um, drivers of, of human experience or perhaps within say political science or even within sociology as well, we may see it as being more normatively defined as well. So all of these different things, all of these different factors mean that social capital can be understood in very different ways across all of the literature. But unfortunately, it's the same term, the same social capital you know, words that are used to describe uh, this concept, even though it can be incredibly different. So there's been various attempts to try to categorize all of these different understandings and approaches in the literature. So here are four different publications that have attempted to, to create these sorts of categories or boxes for, for these different approaches. And I think this is quite useful to try to understand the different meanings that can be attributed to social capital. But we also need to keep in mind that these boxes uh, don't work very well. You know, there's, there's a lot of literature that sort of fits somewhere in between. And so it can be quite challenging. And I'll present a, a set of different conceptual approaches shortly. And I think it's useful when to, to understand the literature in this way. But before we do that, I want to dig in a little bit more to, to these under, different understandings of social capital to explore what is meant um, by this, this term social capital. So some literature focuses exclusively on relationships, on the existence of relationships. So it looks at, at patterns of how people are connected. 
Other research may include the qualities of those relationships. So these relational properties, you know, whether or not there's trust or belonging or solidarity within those relationships as well. And then other, other approaches to social capital may even go further and look at the nature of social organization, you know, the way, the way in which institutions create rules and norms and shape the experience within those relationships as well. So we can see there's quite a lot of quite a bit of variation already as to whether you focus exclusively on relationships, or you also include the quality of those relationships, or you also include social organization as well. And as I mentioned, the different levels can have quite a significant impact on how you think about and you look at social capital. But of course, they're all interrelated. And so individuals are influenced by the group and society to which they belong. And group and society are comprised of individuals. So even if we're interested at this level of, of the individual, I think it would be wise to see how the other levels influence the, the, the nature of, of social action at that level. Um, and same with community or society. We, we can look at that level, but we need to understand community and society is made up of social groupings and individuals as well. And that adds a bit of a layer of complexity. So as I mentioned before, private good, so something that is of benefit to the individual that I can develop social capital for myself and I can utilise the benefits for myself. I can invest and I can get a return on that investment and perhaps it's a private good. But perhaps it's a public good uh, from a different perspective where society or a group can invest in and grow social capital for the benefit of everybody. Or perhaps it has qualities that are both private and public in nature. So if we, if we think about the, the different conceptual approaches, we, we can think about connectedness as being really important. So these are the network and social structures. We also have sociability, so the nature of the relationships that we have, you know, the norms and trust and goodwill. But it's also important to think about the resources as well. So the wealth, the power, the influence, the information, the material, and all of those kinds of things as well. And so a fairly, quite a simple way of thinking about the, the different conceptual approaches is that the network approach focuses ex, ex, exclusively on connectedness, you know, the configuration, the way in which the um, relationships are structured. The resource approach is also looking at networks and the way in which we're connected, but it's really interested in the resources that may exist, that may be mobilized, that may be transferred and transmitted within that network that can provide benefit. And then the normative approach is also focusing on networks, uh, but it's interested in the sociability, the, the nature of those social relationships. And so we can see all three of these approaches include networks, and then the difference is whether you also include resources or you also include the, the aspects of sociability. But this doesn't include all of the different approaches to social capital by any means. And one of the key ones I've missed out is the work of Pierre Bourdieu. And so what I would suggest is we could think of this as being five different approaches. So the first three were on the previous slide. Then we have Bourdieu's approach, which is distinctly different. And then I've included this other category, this heterodox categories of other approaches that don't fit into any of the other four approaches. So what I'll do is I'll quite quickly run through each of these five approaches and keeping in mind, of course, that these are just boxes that we try to, to put different um, bits of research into um, doesn't fit perfectly well, of course. So social capital is connections between individuals. It's, it's their social network that, that produces benefits. I think the important thing here is that it's not a single approach, but it's a variety of different but similar approaches. But what it does is it focuses on the analysis of the network. So it's things like mapping social ties, identifying configurations, analyzing directionality and reciprocity. And then we are attributing qualities to that social structure. So things like density and multiplexity and segregation and structural holes and leadership boundaries and bridges and all of these kinds of aspects of the structure of the network. And some key authors to look out for if in the literature are uh, authors such as Ronald Bird and Mark Grenevetter, who I think are probably the key authors in, in this area. But of course, there are many hundreds and perhaps even thousands of other authors who have taken this kind of approach. 
The resource approach, I think, is very, very similar because it's also focused on the existence of social networks, but it's interested in how resources or what resources exist and are mobilized through those social networks. And this is really a rebranding of social resource theory that was developed uh, primarily, or, or key author in that area was Nan Lin, who defined social resources as the wealth and status and power as well as the social ties of those persons who are directly or indirectly linked to the individual. And so this really asks that question, what resources exist in the network and, and how much are they being mobilised? How can they be mobilised within the network to produce benefits? So very similar to network, but with the key distinction being that network focuses on the configuration or structure, whereas resource approach focuses more on the existence and mobilisation of those resources. The normative approach is, is the nature of social organisation that influences positive or beneficial outcomes. So it focuses on the normative social structural arrangements that result from actors working together for mutual benefit. So it tends to focus on norms as well as values and beliefs about social interaction or shared social interaction. And it tends to focus on culture and socialization and the internalization and norms and values that influence the nature of social action. So whether or not we are cooperative um, or whether or not we are trusting or, or those kinds of things. And the key authors here are uh, James Coleman and, and Robert Putnam. Um, Perhaps it's not quite so simple because some authors in the literature say that James Coleman's approach is, is perhaps quite similar to a network approach and that Putnam's approach perhaps is, is altogether different again. But I think they probably belong and fit here um, best, although not perfectly. And I mentioned that Pierre Bourdieu's approach is distinctly different from the others because for, for his approach, social capital enables a person to exert power on a group or individual who mobilizes the resources. So it is still about the network and it is still about the resources, similar to both the network and the resource approach. However, Bourdieu's approach really focuses on those structural constraints that, um, that create unequal access to institutional resources based on class and gender and race. And the difference is that his approach is grounded in theories of social reproduction and social power. You know, so his, his approach is, is really about how a, an individual's position within a social structure, within society, can afford them many benefits, social capital um, benefits as a result of that position. So it's really quite different. It's, it's kind of power over others rather than power from or power to others. Um, so a very, very different way of thinking about social capital. And even though that's four different and quite quite different conceptual approaches, there's also a, a vast group of, of other approaches that don't fit neatly into those other categories. Um, they're elusive, they're difficult to identify, but I've identified what I think are a couple of, of examples here. So Adler and Kwong talking about goodwill that's available to individuals or groups. Uh, Lyndon Robison and co-authors talking about sympathy towards another person or group, and Costover and Roth had talked about it being so, uh, psychological states, perceptions and behavioural expectations. So a question for you then is which one of these approaches do you think fits best for your research? Do you think you're um, interested in and it makes sense to use a network type approach looking at the configuration? or a resource type approach looking at the, the mobilization of resources, or the normative approach, board use approach, or heterodox approach. So it'd be great if you could post in, in the chat which one of these, or perhaps more than one if you think that's what you need to do, um, is going to be a best fit for your research. Keeping in mind here, of course, there's, there's no right answer. You know, one of these approaches isn't necessarily better than other approaches. They're just different ways of thinking about social capital and going about conducting research in this area. So anyone, anyone think you know which approach fits your research? And Tara says, tossing up between Bourdieu and network and resource, um, looking at network density of entrepreneurial outcomes. Yeah, 
I think there can be a tendency here sometimes to, to want to do everything um, in research. So we might be thinking, well, we want to look at the configuration of a network, but then we also want to look at resources because we know that's important too. But maybe we also want to look at norms and trust and those kinds of aspects as well, because we know that's important too. And then maybe we also want to look at how class and, and gender and race and all of these kinds of things also might influence the way in which social capital is mobilized. And so we try to include Bourdieu as well. And then maybe even a whole lot of like more heterodox approaches, looking at sympathy and goodwill and all these kinds of ideas. And before we know it, we've got this enormous melting pot of, of different ideas. And it, that can be really difficult. Um, I don't think that's necessarily going to produce the best research. Um, so, but then again, not necessarily, you don't necessarily need to pick one of these and, and stay exclusively within it, um, because some of these, of course, have, have limitations as well. So we'll move on. There's only a couple more slides, and then we can get into some discussion about all these kinds of ideas. So I think if, if I could go back 20 years and or so, and if, if someone could help me to read the literature, I think the key thing that I would like to know is, is what these different meanings are, these, these conceptualizations that I've been talking about, and what sort of theoretical foundations and, and methods, you know, if I could, if I could understand that a bit better from the beginning, it would make things so much easier. Because um, when you read literature for the first time, I think quite often you can it can be a bit mixed and confused. You can be reading about social capital being networks. And then you pick up the next journal article and you're reading about how social capital is, is resources. And then the next thing you pick up, it's talking about social norms and trust. And it can be really confusing how the same term is being used to refer to these quite different things. Um, so I think you know having an understanding of the kinds of approaches that I've just been talking about can really help you to, to read the literature and perhaps uh, narrow in on which part of the literature, which approach is going to be most useful and relevant for you. But there's some other things to look out for as well, because we would hope that any one journal article or book would fall neatly into one of those conceptual approaches, but we definitely don't find that. We tend to find that there's, there's overlap or a bit of mixture and confusion even in the literature, even among these, these scholars who are publishing this work in peer-reviewed journals, it's not always clear. And it can be really un, and it can be really confusing about what they what a particular uh, author is actually meaning when they say social capital. Um, I did quite a big survey of the literature a couple of years ago, 250 articles where I looked for uh, which authors they cited for a definition. And I tried to put them into each of the them into a conceptual box. Um, didn't work very well because so many of them didn't fit neatly into any of those boxes. And quite a lot of the, the authors would cite multiple definitions from quite different conceptual approaches, and they wouldn't necessarily identify which one they were adopting for their research. And so that can, can create quite a lot of confusion, and uh, it's quite a challenge, really. And the next point is that there are quite a lot of tautologies to be found in the literature. I've said some, but I think it's perhaps a little bit more than that. And what I mean by a tautology is it's a statement that is true by virtue of its logical form alone. And so if we're defining social capital as being positive, and then we're interested in how important that is for a particular social activity, then of course we're going to find that it is because we've defined social capital as being positive. So of course it's going to be important for the social activity where it will be positive. And so we tend to find these kinds of, of truisms or, or tautologies in the literature. And the other big challenge is that, that some of the assumptions that are made in the literature are quite unjustified uh, and may have been based on some correlational data in previous research, but then uh, future authors have taken it as being fact and have presented it without examining whether or not that, that uh, assumption can be justified. So I think it's important to be quite critical of the literature as you're reading it. You know, yes, it's published in peer-reviewed journals or it's books that have been published by academic press, um, but it still is worthwhile us all being quite critical of this literature and thinking through these kinds of ideas as we approach it. 
The next thing is when you're conducting research on social capital, the first challenge, if you like, or one of the key challenges is to choose a definition and a conceptual approach that you'll use. Um, so there are hundreds of different definitions, and I'd encourage you not to make up your own. You know, there already are so many. I'm sure you'll be able to find one that fits quite neatly with your research and ideally also fits and matches your conceptual approach as well. We certainly don't want you to do what I just mentioned before, which is to list various different definitions to only not settle on one. And therefore, you're not being clear about what social capital actually is for your particular research. And that can, of course, lead to a whole range of different uh, problems and challenges. The other challenge is the literature review. Be because the term means so many different things, and the literature is so incredibly vast, there, there's literally tens of thousands of publications on social capital, you can't possibly review all of it. You know, you can't achieve that circularity where you get to a point where you find a publication you haven't read before, and then you have a look at the references and you've effectively read all of their references. That's when you get to circularity. But that's incredibly difficult when the literature is so broad. And you also perhaps need to make some decisions about whether or not you review literature that doesn't fit with your conceptual approach. So do you review all of the literature based on Bourdieu if you're taking a network approach to social capital? Now, and that's not a, a, a question for me to answer. I think you would need to talk about that with your, your research supervisors or perhaps with colleagues if you're not doing a PhD um, to determine what you think is most appropriate in that space. Um, and I think see that as being a bit of a challenge when you're doing a literature review because you may need to be able to quickly identify publications that are relevant and then to discard those publications that you decide are not relevant for your literature review. Then there's the issue of measurement. And unfortunately, there isn't a blueprint for measurement. So I'm, I'm very often asked, I'm doing uh, this particular research and, and how should I measure social capital? And, and there isn't an answer that I can give at this stage, unfortunately, because there are a um, lot of people have measured social capital for sure. There's, there's probably hundreds of different instruments out there that have been used to measure social capital, but there isn't agreement about which measure is best. There isn't even really agreement about which measure is best for any given context. And so this is something that you'll need to grapple with yourself to, to look at what has been done and work out for you, for your conceptual approach and your definition, the measurement technique that is best suited. And whichever approach you use, it's going to be complicated by the nature of social capital, which tends to be somewhat tangible, but also intangible, and also tends to be quite dynamic as well, because it, it changes dynamically over time as people interact and different events and things occur. And so you need to grapple with that, whether you measure it in a, a snapshot in time or whether or not you're interested in the way in which it changes over a period of time. And I think just about everybody agrees that social capital is, is multidimensional. So if you're measuring social capital, you probably need to measure more than one dimension, perhaps three, depending on what conceptual approach to social capital you're taking. And then, of course, the other challenge is the availability of data and the challenges of data collection. And this is maybe isn't such a big problem if you're looking at the individual level, but if you're looking at the societal level, then you, you may need to utilize data that was not collected for the purpose of measuring social capital and you need to, to make it fit and you need to justify why its use is appropriate based on your understanding of what social capital is. So that can, can be a little bit of a challenge. So in terms of getting further support, I think the first thing that I'd recommend you do if you aren't already is, is to join the International Social Capital Association because membership in that association will get, get you access to, to networks and people and make connections and ISCA is running a lot of free events as well. You can tap into PhD sessions and discussion sessions and networking events and webinars and these research design and methods workshops and so forth. And there's also an enormous amount of resources on the Institute for Social Capital's website, socialcapitalresearch.com. Hundreds of articles that look at different uh, definitions and different approaches, 
um, the dimensions of social capital that discusses the, the levels, the, all of these kinds of resources exist for free. And there's also some online courses as well that you could take if you're interested in taking what I've been talking about today and just taking it further like getting into definition and, and into some of these dimensions and levels and, and these kinds of different approaches. So that's the end of the, the presentation portion. I'll just stop the recording. <laughs>